Now uh, we are uh, waiting for our uh, first keynote speaker. Uh, she's ready. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Sarita, good morning. Can you hear me? Very good morning. I can hear you very well. Thanks for joining us today uh, uh, in our uh, second symposium. We're delighted to have you, such a, uh, a key uh, woman, lady in, in, the, in the sector. And uh, Dr. Sarita uh, Aron Kumar, she's Executive Security Advisor and Master Inventors for IBM Security Command Center in Europe. Uh, to be honest, your CV it's really impressive. So I highlighted a few points uh, from your CV. Uh, Sarita, she's a thought leader for 20, uh, 20, uh, over 22 years experience in cybersecurity space, leading and shaping cybersecurity upcoming emerging like blockchain, biometrics, IoT security, and uh, decentralized identity. And uh, she has also achieved a PhD in mobile security, MBA in operation management, winner of the top 100 Asian uh, stars in the UK Tech 2018, winner of the Tech Women 50 in 2017, and runner, running up of the Women of the Future in 2013, Outstanding Innovation Award winner in 2017. I hope I cover the most important part, Sarita. Thank you very much. I wouldn't like to take much, much time. I would like to hear from you and your experience. Our audience would like to hear from you. So, and then once you finish, we will open the floor for any questions from the audience. So, Sarita, would like to hear from you. Thank you for joining us. The mic is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. A very warm welcome to all of you once again. Uh, Unfortunately, I'm not able to be there in person. It looks like a lovely setup there, uh, but hopefully I'll try and do justice uh, being here virtually. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend... Uh, is, is the is, is audio, okay? audio okay? Because I can hear a little bit of echo coming back. So if you can hear me okay, I'll carry on. We can hear you okay, sorry. Okay, perfect. All right, perfect. OK, so what I'm going to do is I will uh, two topics is what I'm going to try and spend my time on. It's a little bit difficult to cover everything in the time I have, but I'll try and cover a little bit around blockchain, blockchain security. What are some of the key things to think about when we try and address um, securing blockchain solutions? The other uh, side of uh, topic that I want to cover is about the latest cybersecurity threats and the trends and where the market is going towards and what are some of the things that uh, we can think about and some of the key messages that needs to go out um, to individuals, to organizations and so on. So with that in mind, I am going to get started with uh, a little bit of insight on blockchain. Uh, I guess I don't need to go into a lot of details. Everybody knows what blockchain is. It's a shared replicated permission leisure. We are able to do a number of things uh, having blockchain, the immutability aspect. We can look at the integrity aspect. We can look at availability. The whole consensus comes into a really good play with blockchain. A lot of organizations that I've worked with. So um, just, just to kind of um, look back. So I came up with a blockchain point of view after working with uh, large organizations, whether it's banking or whether it's retail, over a period of time, doing a lot of blockchain deployments and doing security design and architecture for blockchain uh, projects, um, I've seen that a lot of organization likes to uh, like to go uh, towards the consortium, towards having a network, their own kind of a blockchain where they're able to carry on transactions with integrity in mind, with availability in mind, having that consensus and being able to endorse each other's transaction with the identity in mind, but also having confidentiality uh, in the mix. So that's where uh, the whole blockchain um, plays an important role where organizations, different parts of the business or different organizations who work together, want to come together, uh, have this um, private kind of a network where they're able to trust each other and want to allow transactions happening between each other, but at the same time want the whole aspect of sh having this shared ledger with identity and confidentiality in the mix. 
um, just to kind of overlook the overall uh, network or just to give you a little bit of insights before getting into the whole, uh, what is it that we need to secure, how we think about securing blockchain and where blockchain plays a very important role in the whole cybersecurity or in the whole security arena. I just want to paint the picture so you can understand what are the different um, key elements that exist in the overall blockchain network whenever you think of you know, a, a blockchain solution or architecture or where blockchain can be applied. So here are the key things just laid out. Let's have a look at it from right to left. So as an end user, you can think about yourself as an end user or, uh, or a user of a particular portal, whether it's a banking application, whether it's a, a travel website, whether it's a retail website, whether it's a shopping website. So any one of those, you can think about it in that uh, terms. As an end user, you log into a particular application for which you need to have some kind of authentication, authorization. Once you do that, it then goes into some kind of an application server where we create an integration logic that takes all of the things that you do while you log in as an end user and then take some of the things from there into the box that I call the black, uh, blockchain platform. The blue box there on the um, on the on the um, the blue box that you see next to beside the application server and the integration logic is the blockchain platform box inside which there's another box which is showing all the different components of blockchain. So you can think about these as three different layers, your presentation layer, your business layer and your data layer. And this is exactly the same setup you would have when there's more than one organization. What I showed you here is for one organization. But remember what I said earlier that a lot of organizations work together as a consortium when they think about having a blockchain solution in the mix. So everything. So here I have four different organizations. They all come via their different portals, their login screens. Then they go through the application server and come into the blockchain platform. That's where all of the different peer networks, different certificates are stored. That's where all of the endorsement is happening. All the ordering service does the consensus and so on. So I won't go into too much technical details, but just at the high level, you can see that when a number of organizations come together into this uh, blockchain network, or as I call it, the consortium, they are then able to all talk to each other via this one platform called as the blockchain platform. In order for um, any solution, whether it's um, a solution that has a lot of security components or something that is part of a blockchain infrastructure or a blockchain capability, there are a number of things that we need to think about. And I am going to uh, just quickly zoom in to the blockchain platform just so you can see what are the different components at a high level again. Depending on how many organizations there are, you'll have a number of peers, which means you'll have peer level membership services. There will be some kind of a ledger and a database store there. There'll be a chain code that keeps track of all of the transactions, all of the different things that's happening between the different peers. And to bring it all together is something called as the ordering service. So when there are endorsements that different organization do for a particular transaction, it's the ordering service that then brings it all together to form the consensus. So if you think of it like something that takes everything and then integrates and then comes to a final consent, that's what the ordering service is about. So that's just me zooming into the blockchain platform for you just to see, uh, just to show you what's in it. But going back to my point about how would you look at knowing what is blockchain doing? How is it adding to the overall security? And what is blockchain bringing to the overall security, right? So there are a number of things that you'd need to consider before you go ahead and create a solution that's a secure blockchain solution. And the way I categorize it is every time I have a request for a blockchain capability or a solution to be implemented, whether it's for a financial organization, retail, healthcare, whatever it is, I will always review it based on uh, two main things. One is I'd look at the risks and then I'll look at the threats. And based on looking at the risks, reviewing the risks and the threats, I would then come up with a number of security controls that would fit around blockchain, not just blockchain, but remember there are so many other components that are beyond the blockchain platform. Remember the blue box? 
beyond that blue box, there was so many other components as well that brings the whole applications or the whole network together, right? So like I said, the first thing I'd look at is risk and I can categorize risk into three areas. One is from a business perspective. The second is from a process perspective. And the third is from a technical perspective. So business, process, and technical. And under each one of, one of them, there are a number of things that I would normally review when it comes to deciding how to create a blockchain solution and how to make it a secure blockchain solution. It could be from a business perspective, looking at the operation, the legal and compliance angles. It could be looking at the financial side of things. It'd be looking at governance side of things. It would be looking at access controls. Let's say there are 10 organizations in the, in the consortium, in the network. Who takes responsibility? Where's the data going to be stored? Who handles uh, the access provisions? The, uh, who handles the, uh, the data? Who is the data controller? Who takes care of uh, where the data should be stored? How it should be stored? Who is monitoring the logs? So there are a number of things that you can think of from an access perspective, right? And there's a lot of decision making as well. Uh, when you have a network, when you have a consortium of a lot of different organizations coming together. And these are some of the things that needs to be thought through right at the beginning, even before you get to the design phase, even before you get to the implementation phase. These are some things that we would normally review right at the beginning to make sure that all of the stakeholders, all of the different organizations coming together to create a blockchain solution understand and are on board. Looking at the process uh, category of risks, um, this is pretty straightforward, and I don't need to explain this to all of you experts there, right? We will look at identity access management. We'd look at how to do secure communications. We would look at um, what would happen if there's a misuse of a blockchain identity key. Where would you store the identity keys? Is it on a HSM, a hardware security module, or would you store it somewhere else? Who takes responsibility of uh, renewing those keys? If there is revocation that needs to happen, who takes responsibility of that? So there are questions like these that needs to be addressed when it comes to the process side of things. And process is more uh, technical, right? You're thinking about uh, some of the technical aspects that would come into picture more uh, so for the blockchain solution itself. Alongside the process, there are a few technical, key technical aspects that's very specific to the blockchain solution. And you may think of infrastructure to uh, security to be generic, but when there is blockchain in the mix, there's a lot more that needs to be thought through because we think about a number of other components that come together for the blockchain solution to, uh, to exist. There are also a few other things that's very specific to blockchain, like some of the risks that comes with smart contract. Uh, what happens with the deleting, the auditability and the consensus side of things? What happens with validating the ledger? Remember, I showed, I zoomed into the blockchain platform and I showed you the different components there, like the peer membership. There was the shared ledger. There was a state DB. So what happens with specific risks that exists on each one of those? So summarizing all of this, we'd look at all of these different risks. Once, once we look at the risk, we straight away then look at what are the threats. And the threats I have categorized into them into three key areas. One is your conventional threats that have been existing forever and you know nothing new about it. Uh, so conventional attack management needs to be done. The second one is the conventional attacks that take on a new meaning because blockchain is now in the mix. And what I mean by that is looking at smart contracts, looking at malicious transactions, looking at user impersonation, uh, looking at disruption of services and so on. And then the last one is, is key to blockchain. And this is the new attack la landscape. Because blockchain is now part of the solution, there are some new threats that have been posed specific to blockchain. And we keep reviewing this on a regular basis. There are a lot of new threats that are posed based on blockchain coming into the mix, into the whole uh, application security or into the whole solution. And these keep evolving. So we have to keep a, a constant eye on constant view on what could be some of the new attack landscape as well. So we consider all of this. We take care of all of this, look at all of this. And based on the threats that are uh, pretty much, um, if you think of it, 
the risks that are actually considered for a particular solution because not all risks will apply to all organizations and not all risks will apply to all types of solutions that we design. So based on the risks that are applicable, based on the threats that are applicable, we then go ahead and design the security controls. So we look at the risks, we look at the threats, and then we come up with the security controls. And again, I categorize the security controls into three key areas. One is the security controls that's unique to blockchain solution. So this exists only in the blockchain solution space. The second set of controls are conventional security controls, which you will apply anyway. Even before blockchain existed, you were applying these to all of your solutions when you designed them. And then the third uh, category is the business controls. So I'm going to quickly brief through them. I won't go too much in detail, but quickly brief through them. So the ones that are unique to blockchain could be some of these, like enforcing hardware security module, enforcing identity and access controls to access blockchain solution. It could be leveraging the trusted platform modules, TPMs, we call it, for sensitive code execution, and this exists only within the blockchain capability. Um, looking at um, the API security best practices, because there's so much uh, API integration that happens with blockchain in the mix and so on. So there's quite a few there that are very unique to the blockchain solution. The two other categories, as I highlighted, the conventional one, pretty standard. We have we have been using this much, much before blockchain even came into existence. Like, you know, mandating multi-factor authentication, enforcing application security, enforcing um, best practices for secure coding, something that we've do, been doing forever, right? Uh, looking at uh, penetration testing, vulnerability assessment. So these are pretty standard, but we would still apply these when we design a blockchain solution. And then the business controls. So these business controls would be looking at defining the governance side of things, compliance, legal controls, uh, thinking about the operational controls. So every time you design a solution, the phases, if you look at the life cycle, right? You, you, you start with um, capturing all of the requirements. You kind of do a capacity assessment planning. Then you go to the design phase. You do a high level design. You do a detailed design. You then start thinking about the implementation aspects. You would then go into the build phase. Once the build is done and the release is out there for a, a solution, you would then have to think about the operational side. Like once the build phase is done, someone has to take care of all of the operations beyond the build phase, right? Because the, the, the solution is going to be live. Everyone is going to be using it. There has to be a team that takes care of just the operational side of things. What if some keys uh, are expired or revoked? So there's, there has to be a process as well. So that's why these business controls look at defining the scope and implementing some of the operational controls. Now, to bring all of this together, let's say we apply all of these controls. The zoomed in box that you saw earlier on the blockchain platform with all of the red, um, new red circles there, these are all the different security controls that we need to put inside the black, uh, blockchain platform. This slide is specifically to show that it doesn't, as soon as you put blockchain into the solution, it doesn't mean that it's a secure solution. You still need to put security controls inside the blockchain platform to make a blockchain solution a secure solution. So this is that zoomed in blockchain platform. And on the outside, remember, I showed this earlier on to you as well. So you can see the controls that we've applied inside the blockchain platform. At the same time, we need a number of controls that we just touched on outside as well. Remember, as you're logging into an application, you have to think about infrastructure security, security operations, the whole identity and access management, the security gateway, a certificate authority to issue certificates and so on. So there, there are a number of things that needs to be considered. So all in all, in order to think of creating a, a secure blockchain based solution, You'll have to start looking at the risks. You have to look at the threats and then come up with the security controls. So if you have ignored everything I've said before, this is the one slide you can take away from how you can create a secure uh, blockchain solution. Look at the orange box there. That's where you look at all the risks. And then the green one where you look at all the threats. And then underneath it, 
the blue boxes there, which is defining the security controls based on the risks and based on the threats. And if you do this, this is a really nicely tested model that I have used over and over again. And I've shared it with a, a lot of uh, people. I've shared it with a lot of uh, architects. I've externally shared it as well. Something that really works. And you can apply this to any blockchain solution that you're designing. So that's that's kind of a, a, a very fast paced uh, explanation on how you can think about creating a secure blockchain solution when you're looking at blockchain. So just switching gears a little bit now, I want to move towards uh, talking about uh, cybersecurity trends, some of the threats and the landscape and so on. You know, as uh, as you know, I work for the IBM Security Command Center and in the last 10 years, I spent a lot of time working very closely with the C-levels, like C-suites, like the chief information security officer, could be a, a CIO, CFO, uh, a lot of different C-level uh, leaders and also board of directors and senior leaders within a number of organizations. And I've been helping them think about, one, how to put security in the forefront of any of their uh, agenda, their business, and also how to help them be better prepared for cyber attacks. Because today I cannot say if an organization will be under a, an attack. It's more like when. So more and more organizations are working very closely to go through cyber uh, security trainings or simulations, as you call. The picture you see here is of uh, the command center that uh, that we use, where we bring in these C-levels, these board of directors, take them through an experience of going through a cyber incident, a very close to real cyber attack situation scenario, but then they are able to understand, identify gaps, think through some of the best practices as we share a lot of best practices and also be able to test what is it that they exist in their organizations and how they can be better prepared. Okay, so with, with that uh, context, I'm going to share some statistics, some information um, that will help you better understand as to why uh, being better prepared for cyber attacks is the new normal. Okay. Um, cost of a data breach report. So this is something that the Poneman Institute uh, works on every year, every single year. It's been going on for a um, few decades now, and uh, IBM Security works very closely with them year on year. And we come up with something called as a cost of a data breach report. The one for 2022 is not out yet because it comes at the end of the year. This one is from 2021, but it's pretty close. So you can have a look at it. So 537 organizations were interviewed. Those that were breached that went through or were a victim of a cyber attack. And this was across 17 countries, 17 regions and across 17 different industries. And you can see that the average total cost of a data breach is around $4.24 million. Okay, this is in 2021. And you can see the trends in the last, like since 2015. Okay, um, and this is why more and more organizations are trying to be very vigilant, very alert, very cyber aware as well. A few more stats for you. This is the average total cost of data breach by industry. You can see how the different industries are playing. Here I'm showing you the healthcare industry. You can see is, um, is, is going the cost there of a data breach for a healthcare organization is pretty high with around $9.23 million. You can see the financial organization, pharmaceuticals there, in, uh, energy companies, industrial organizations. So this gives you a view of... Uh, the average uh, cost of data breach that different industries have been facing. Uh, and, and you see the colors there, the purple is more of 2021 and the blue there is of 2020. So the number has increased from 2020, even within a year from 2020 to 21, you can see there is a, a significant uh, increase in some of the industries. Okay, let's look at uh, what are the triggers? So, you know, I talked about, um, the cost of a data breach and I talked about how it's affecting different industries. This slide gives you a view of what are some of the initial attack vectors. So threat actors or cyber criminals, what do they target? What are the ways by which they are initiating their attacks? You can see social engineering is pretty standard. And, and on this topic, I want to say 
uh, open source intelligence has been made use of in the last two to four years, it's been made use of a lot more than it was before. The threat landscape has changed uh, since COVID. Uh, threat actors, cyber criminals are using quite a lot of open source intelligence information that's out there in order to misuse, uh, in order to exploit individuals and organizations. Business email compromise has been there all of the time. Uh, it still continues. Organizations are putting in a lot of corporate uh, security policies in place, but it still continues uh, to, to be a, a, a big worry and a big uh, attack vector that uh, threat actors focus on. Accidental data loss and uh, loss data. I mean, you can still read on news right about these things. Malicious insiders, again, a problem for organizations. There's uh, some on the right side there. Vulnerability in third party softwares. Phishing is still uh, a big issue for a lot of organizations. And you can see the cost there as well. You know, cost is quite a lot. So phishing is four point six five million dollars. Business email compromises around five million dollars. Compromised credentials around four point three seven million dollars. So these give you an indication about what are the focus areas for the threat actors, right? That uh, are trying to trigger or get into organizations. Now, I highlighted uh, earlier on that um, you know how it's impacting the industries, how it's costing, uh, and so on. The trend, and this is 2020 and 2021, and um, pretty much uh, the number is the same. Since 2020, I think the, the number of days has gone up slightly, but you can see that uh, the time it takes to identify and then contain the data breach is nearly around 287 days, and you can add this up. So 246 and then 89 days. So the purple there is to identify that a breach has happened. And then the 89 days there is to then contain. It's it's getting more and more difficult for organizations to actually get to the bottom of how the data breach occurred in the first place. And from whatever you've seen so far since I started talking about the cyber breach, this slide is that summary slide that you can take away. You know, minimum 287 days to identify and contain a breach. Every organization that's been through a ransomware attack, you can see that their stock value falls at least by 15% within the first 10 days. The global average total cost uh, increase of the data breach from 2020 or 21, it's gone up at least by 10%. And then the annual cost of the cyber crime on the global economy is getting again worse. It's it's gone up uh, from one trillion dollars, uh, and this is this is just some of the stats that I'm sharing with you, so uh, you can see and understand. This is not scaring, uh, uh, trying to scare anyone, but this is just laying out the statistics there to show uh, why um, organizations have been busy. But at the same time, why organizations are doing more these days in terms of cybersecurity. And this is also to say that what's keeping me busy all the time is trying to help the C-suite, the senior leaders, board of directors on an everyday basis to help them see what the gaps are in uh, their existing security solutions. A couple things I want to share with you uh, about this uh, boom slide. And this could probably be uh, the takeaway. So I have two of these boom slides, which I really like, and my favorite slides whenever I talk about cyber attacks. First of all, what is boom? Boom is that moment when you lose control on information. It's basically when, so the news about an organization being a victim of cyber attack is out there in the public eye. Everybody knows about it. That's the boom moment. So is the boom moment clear? Can, can you give me a thumbs up? Okay, I see a few nods. Okay, perfect. So yeah, so that's what the boom moment is. When the news about an organization being a victim of a cyber crime or cyber attack is out there in the news, that's the boom moment. But you see there are a lot of things that happens on the left of boom and the right of boom. The left of boom is where organizations try to put in a lot of threat prevention processes, controls, mechanisms, but still, right? Malwares get deployed, phishing emails still come through, Credentials still get stolen and so on. Let's look at the right hand side of the boom. The right hand side of the boom is your crisis response. And this is where a lot of organizations find it difficult to cope because once boom happens, press is all over the place, stocks keep falling, there's the legal side of things that needs to happen, investigation needs to happen. So many things 
need to happen at a very, very rapid phase. And not all organizations are ready for this. So, and there is, and if you see, there's no clear processes and procedures in place to deal with all of these at the same time, right? So let me show you the next slide. Where I'd like all of the organizations, institutions, whatever it is, where I'd like them to be is what I call the left of left of boom, never to get to the boom moment, never to get to the right of boom. But I'd like every single organization and institution to be on the left of left of boom. And why? Because if you're on the left of left of boom, you can practice, you can train, you can think about a number of things like what are your top assets? What are your crown jewels? What are the threats that could be posed on your crown jewels? And then what are the effects? You can also think about what controls to put in place, right? So this gives you uh, the flexibility, if I may say, to think through all of this, but to prepare your uh, individuals within your uh, organization, institution, but also to test a lot of things and better prepare yourselves never to get to the boom and never to get to the right hand side of the boom. So does that make sense? Does the boom slide make sense? OK, perfect. All right. So um, so some of the things that um, is, is really good in terms of a takeaway is as we are seeing more and more uh, organizations, I work with organizations and with a lot of institutions across EMEA because that's my role. So I cover Europe, Middle East uh, and Africa region. And I work with a lot of uh, universities, a lot of uh, organizations, and they want to think about putting uh, crisis best practices in place for which they want to have a number of cyber runbooks in place. Playbooks and runbooks is uh, they define exactly what is it that we need to do if you're faced with a certain situation. Like if our website goes down, what would we do? Do we have a backup? Uh, if a particular server goes down, what is the action? What is the uh, leadership decision? What's the technical decision and so on? Uh, a crisis framework is something that is really relevant and important for uh, any type of business, whether it's universities, whether it's organizations. So that's something that uh, is essential and something that's really relevant to think about. Leadership under pressure, right? So this is uh, really key. So I talked about that boom moment. So you can think about a breaking news on, a, uh, on your telly where they say organization X and Y is a victim of a cyber attack. Now, once that breaking news is out there, it's important to respond to that. So as, as the head of the organization or somebody who's responsible to be in front of the media for uh, an organization or a university, you'd have to come up with something called as a media statement, which clearly tells what is it that went wrong? What are we doing to protect our data? How are we trying to go on with business right now when we are trying to recover and so on? The other side to the leadership uh, under pressure is the leader's intent. What's a leader's intent? It's a clear, repeatable message that goes out to everybody within the organization, within an institution, when things go wrong. It's not just your external uh, parties that are panicking, right, when an organization is a victim of a cyber attack. Internally also, everybody would be panicking because they wouldn't know what to do. You know, I have worked in situations with organizations where uh, we try to take care of customers and we try to give a lot of clear messages to customers. But internally, the employees didn't know what to do. They had no access to systems. Communication systems were down. You just think about Maersk. Everybody remembers Maersk, the largest logistics and shipping company. When they had a cyber attack, all of their systems went down, including their communication systems. They had no way to talk to the employees within the organization. And guess what? They reverted to WhatsApp, not the most professional way of communicating for an organization like Maersk, but they didn't have an option. They had to revert to WhatsApp to communicate between the employees. And this is where uh, I usually talk about something called as a PACE model. Don't know if you've heard of it. It's P-A-C-E, primary, alternate, contingency, emergency model. So PACE is a really good model that a lot of organizations, institutions are applying. Because if your primary mode of communication goes down, do you have an alternate? What's your alternate? If, you, if your primary and alternate goes down, what's your contingency model? If your primary alternate and contingency goes down, is there an emergency model, right? So, I mean, different people think of it in different ways. Some, some organization have these satellite phones that they use. So if everything goes down, 
satellite phones come to the help, right? In the US, they have something called as a GETS card, G-E-T-S card. Every organization and university can apply it for free and they can use it. So if everything goes down, they know that they can use the GETS card. So these are some of the things that we would normally consider as crisis best practices. Security culture is, is, is another aspect that any uh, industry organization needs to think about. And for me, security culture is made up of four pillars. I call it uh, LACP, leadership, accountability, communication, and policies. So under each pillar, you can think about, you know, what needs to go in and so on. And then um, a fusion team is, is nothing but a crisis management team, right? A fusion team's full business response. What I mean by that is, um, in the in the phase where you're at the left of left of boom, right? You're preparing. So it's good to think about creating a team, which is a fusion team, which is also nothing but a crisis management team. So as that team, you can think about different business stakeholders coming together from a legal, comms, HR, communication, risk, security, from all of these different angles coming together and working together to create a full business response. Okay. Next steps, what would be the ideal next steps? Right? You know, I talked about blockchain. I talked about blockchain security. I touched on a number of different cybersecurity threats and trends and some of the key things that organizations, institutions can think about and, and where the trend is going towards and, and how uh, organizations and institutions are working today in terms of cyber attacks, cybersecurity and cybercrime. Um, if, you, if you want to you know, take away something from this session. Remember that one slide on the security model for blockchain, that would be one slide to take away. And thinking about next steps, right? It would be uh, recommending to test a complete business response to a cyber incident. So putting yourselves in the midst of a close to real cyber incident and to see how prepared one is, how prepared you are, right? And identifying gaps, uh, whether it's in the incident response plans, whether it's in the runbook, playbooks, and so on. And towards doing all of this, it will show you how quickly some of the best like practice decisions can help mitigate risks and costs. So that's kind of the next steps. So every time uh, you think about security threats, cyber attacks, you can think that these are normally the trends that organizations apply. They, they look at what is it that they have, then they try and think about going through a cyber incident where they try and practice being in the middle of a, a close to real cyber incident, a cyber attack. They try to practice the things they have in the organizations and then look at what are the gaps and then use them to refine, to make changes and apply it. So hopefully that's given, uh, it was a very quick view on both the blockchain security aspect and also on the cybersecurity trends. I didn't want to just touch on one topic. I think both the topics are equally important. So I tried to give you a little bit of flavor of both of the things with some stats, with some information and with some real life kind of examples as well. Hopefully that was useful. Um, um, give me a thumbs up if you think it was a thumbs down, if you think it wasn't. <laughs> okay, brilliant, excellent. I think we can uh, jump straight into questions. Uh, more than happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharitha. This is really useful talk. You started to talk about the background of the blockchain basics, and then you move to some uh, uh, co complex uh, issues about uh, and your experience. I like the boom model. I remember uh, last year, summer, there were, there were four or five uni UK universities being attacked, and the other 125 being in the left, and they try to drag themselves to the left. Uh, and this, our IT security team, they put a pressure on us as in, in terms of applying restrictions. And we have one of the labs called Malware Analysis Lab, which we train the student to uh, play with the malware. And with the restriction, we found it difficult until we find a solution, but uh, it's really uh, uh, we, we like the, uh, the, the model you, you presented. Also, in our university, we do have a blockchain lab if, for your information, and we do develop some, and we do need your experience in the future. We are thinking to develop master in blockchain, and uh, I would like to hear your uh, opinion on that. But before that, I would like to open the floor for the audience to ask any questions uh, uh, to Dr. Saritha. Uh, the, 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 you can ask now. The floor is open for any question. 
Yeah, we have one. Um, uh, uh, Can you uh, uh, say your name, your organization, and uh, ask the question? Thank you very much. I'm Jack Dryer, I'm a student from Barclay, uh, UTC. Um, my job blockchain is one is a common attack that I've heard of. Uh, the other attack I've heard is a 51% attack. I don't know whether with business blockchain, whether they're smaller or more vulnerable to that, or what the uh, solution to that is. Um, sorry, that's a Sorry, could you repeat the question? I couldn't hear it. Maybe, maybe uh, can you summarize it for me? As uh, because I can't hear the question clearly from back there. Um, are um, business blockchain models more vulnerable to fifty-one percent attacks and what's the prediction so systems? You're saying are these blockchain solutions more vulnerable uh, to, to what? I missed the last part. Fifty-one percent attacks where if. Uh, you have more than 51% of the computers managing the blockchain, even malicious computers. Okay, well, I guess it, it really depends on how you want to design the solutions, right? Uh, I wouldn't say blockchain solutions are entirely secure, and this is exactly the reason why I zoomed into that blockchain platform box, right? A lot of organizations, they think as soon as we put blockchain in the mix, that's it, my solutions are secure. But that is not the truth. That's why I wanted to make it very clear with that, with that zooming into the blockchain platform. You need to put appropriate controls in place. If you do not put controls in place, even for the blockchain platform, just putting blockchain in the solution is go not going to make it secure. It is still going to be vulnerable. It's still going to be susceptible to different types of attack vectors that come into play. So when you design a blockchain solution, you need to think about, remember the, the two things I said, the risks and the threats. You need to see what are the requirements. What is it that you want to achieve from the block blockchain solution? What is the objective of putting blockchain in place? There, there are some organizations who just want to put blockchain because it's the new buzzword. Uh, you know, I have, I've had, had discussions like that as well with some organization. But what is the real use case? Why do you want to put blockchain in there? And then think about what is it trying to achieve by having blockchain in the mix. And you have to think about all of the things that's around it that is going to play an equally important role and then do a complete assessment of the whole solution, not just the part where blockchain is coming into the solution. It's the, it's the overall solution. That's why the whole architecture. So you need to think about the whole architecture and then step by step, you'll have to do the face by face uh, security reviews, assessments. You need to monitor, uh, keep monitoring the logs as well and make sure that you're doing vulnerability assessment, these penetration ass assessments. This is not a one time thing as well. We try and tell organizations to do it every six months as things evolve, right? Uh, so uh, hopefully that's given you some indication. I'm not sure if I entirely answered the whole question because I missed parts of it. I couldn't hear well. Um, did I answer your question? Excellent. Thank you very much. Yes, he said yes. Yeah, fine. Thank, you. Thank you. He said yes. There is another person yeah, over there. You have two mics to speak into. Good luck with that. Um, hello, hi. I'm Andrew Tomlinson uh, from the University of Worcester. Um, you mentioned about C-level, uh, C-suite uh, managers and the, the importance of getting um, them on board. So I just wondered, really, from your experience, um, what, how, do you, how do we sort of get them on board? How do we get the message across to them? That, that is a very good question. Uh, you know, um, most of the time, um, it, is, it is the C-suite. It's the CISOs, especially the chief information security officer of an organization who's asked, why do you want security? Why do you want a budget for security, right? And it's the CISO who needs to justify why security should be part of the agenda. So I feel that I'm a trusted advisor to these C-levels or C-suites because I'm helping them understand why security should be part of the agenda. And the way we try to get them on board is, you know, it's, it's really straightforward. So I would try and understand what are their current pain points. So I'll, I'll try and understand what are they struggling with? So in the last 12 to 18 months, what's kept them awake at night? What are some of their key worries? What are the areas that they are most concerned about when it comes to organization? This will start opening up a discussion where they'll say, oh, uh, I think this particular asset or this particular uh, systems or these set of clients 
uh, I'm having issues here because I have certain impacts. You know, if anything goes wrong, 24 hours is the maximum. I cannot go down uh, more than that. The systems have to be available. So these sort of discussions give you a view of what is it that they are, their worries are or their concerns are, their pain points are. It kind of ends towards what their crown jewels are or their top assets are that are the focus of their discussions. And once you get to know a little bit about that, it then helps me basically identify the gaps that exist in their current model or their current security solution, or it could be their current um, business model itself. And then unwrapping a lot of questions, it would really help me uh, understand and give them advice on what they can uh, tell the RC suites because they are answerable to the board of directors, right? So a lot of times I would help them saying, you know, think about doing a risk quantification. You know, by doing risk quantification, you'll know it's simple. Risk quantification is done for T, T-E-A. I, um, I always say it that way, T-E-A. Threat, effect, asset. So you look at what the top assets are. You look at the threats that are posed on the assets. You think about the effect. Effect is basically databases getting stolen and so on. If you can work around the TEA, then you can actually decide what controls to put in place. And that will show the dollar value or the pound value that you will lose or you will gain. You will lose by not putting controls and you'll gain by putting controls. So that is a clear way to justify to these C levels what is missing. And there's no um, bluffing here. It's basically straightforward discussion, understanding from them what is it that is lacking or identifying gaps and then helping them understand those gaps and then open up a discussion for the C-levels with the board of directors so that they can get some budget and put security in place. Uh, does, does, it's a long answer, but hopefully that's given you some indication on how we approach. Okay. Good, Dr. Sarita. We have a last question from uh, have to hold both of them. Tim. Okay, no problem. So, Tim Evans, MSc student at the University of Gloucestershire. Um, seeing as blockchain is so heavily rooted on public key cryptography, yeah. and we haven't yet chosen the, the definitive quantum safe algorithms, mm -hmm. is it really the wrong time for most organisations to be looking at blockchain? They really need to wait a couple of years until the quantum safe algorithms are out. Um, I wouldn't say so because uh, so there's a, a lot of organization, a lot of banking sectors, uh, uh, financial sectors uh, and a lot of healthcare organizations and retail have already implemented blockchain solutions and it's working. It's gone live. Uh, so there was one, if you remember, um, I did this project back in 2018, 2019. It was for 10 major banks across Europe. It's called WeTrade. You can look it up, WE uh, Trade online. And this was for 10 major banks across Europe. And the same thing was implemented in Batavia and also in uh, in Hong Kong. So a lot of Hong Kong banks also have Im implemented. So at the time, so when we started in de deploying blockchain solutions, of course, we had to do it, learn it the hard way. And, you know, there were a number of decisions that we had to take based on the availability, the, the current security systems, the, the hardware security models we had in place and so on. But I guess going forward, the model will slightly change. And the reason for that is, um, you know, just of yesterday, I, IBM Zurich uh, announced the quantum, one of the latest quantum safe algorithms uh, being public. So I guess as uh, our solutions and the algorithms are maturing, newer models will come into place. I, you, uh, some of the organizations have asked me, can we use FHE, fully homomorphic encryption in blockchain? Right? Interesting question to ask, but how and where would I place FHE into my blockchain solution? Would it be encrypting the transaction? Would it be using FHE for endorsement? Would it be for consensus? So I think it really matters. So, so far, the solutions that have been implemented, we have taken the utmost care to make sure that they are secure solutions. Uh, I guess going forward, the way the solutions might be designed is they will try and use some advance. It's it's the same as algorithms advance, as technology advance. We try and move towards newer methods, right? And just a simple example there is previously we were using centralized identity solutions. Then we went to, you know, as decentralized identity came into existence, uh, we started looking at decentralized identity. It's still evolving. I'm not saying decentralized identity is fully functional. But the underlying uh, technology there is, again, DLT, distributed ledger technology for decentralized identity. So it's the same. 
maybe you, I'm not giving you a straightforward answer, but uh, but it is it is still going to be considered whatever has been implemented so far. We think that they are secure enough, but you never know. Threat actors are constantly exploiting as well, right? But but at the same time, as technologies as algorithms evolve, we will adapt to it and then add that as as a new way of designing our architectures. Dr. Sarita, thank you very much uh, for your <coughs> for your time and effort. Uh, it's really informative session. We personally, I learned a lot from you. I will be in touch with you to help to help us in uh, uh, establishing, uh, developing our blockchain lab and master in uh, blockchain. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much. My pleasure. Have a good day.